Welcome everyone to Bogleheads on Investing, podcast number 43. Our guest this month is Eduardo Repetto, Chief Investment Officer of Advantis Investors and former Chief Investment Officer and Chief Executive Officer of Dimensional Fund Advisors. Hi, everyone. My name is Rick Ferry, and I'm the host of Bogleheads on Investing. This episode, as with all episodes, is brought to you by the John C. Bogle Center for Financial Literacy, a 501c3 nonprofit organization that you can find at boglecenter.net. Your tax-deductible contributions are greatly appreciated. The Bogleheads investment philosophy is to keep it simple, and that usually means starting a portfolio with a total stock market index fund, a total international index fund, and a high quality fixed income allocation of some type. For most investors, this is all they need to achieve their financial objectives. Sometimes I'm asked, what's next? What's beyond a total stock market and a total international? And my answer is, if you wish to take a little extra risk in your portfolio for the potential of a higher return, then look at small cap value investing. But not just any small cap value fund or small cap value index fund. You want a fund that's low cost and highly concentrated in small cap value factors. The company that pioneered small cap value investing using concentrated factor strategies was Dimensional Fund Advisors, more commonly referred to as DFA. Eduardo Repetto, our guest today, was the chief investment officer and the chief executive officer of DFA until 2017. Then in 2019, Eduardo joined Advantis Investors, a new company by American Century Investors, where he became the CIO and continued to refine factor strategies for their ETFs, mutual funds, and directed accounts. Whether you believe in this or not, or whether you want to include it or not, this is a very interesting discussion as we go behind the scenes with one of the brightest minds in the industry. With no further ado, let me introduce Eduardo Repetto. Welcome, Eduardo. I really appreciate you coming on the Bogleheads on Investing podcast today. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you. We kind of go back a ways. I can remember being in your office at DFA, pleading with you to uh, start ETFs at DFA. That was a few years ago. That's, pro- that's probably 10 years ago or something like that. I don't remember. It was a while back. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Anyway, uh, now both the DFA and uh, your new company have ETFs. So before we go down that road, let's talk a little bit about your very interesting background. Go back as far as you would like to tell us how you got to go from where you started to where you are today. (laughs) So, yeah, I have a weird background. The first thing is I was born in Argentina. Argentina, if you know, was a developed market, then was an emerging market, then was a frontier market. And I don't think that this is a frontier market anymore. It's not even that. So, but I was always a geek. So liking numbers and whatnot. So, I studied engineering. Then I got a master's at Brown in engineering, mechanical engineering. And then I got a PhD in, from Caltech here in California in aeronautical engineering. Yeah. Let me interrupt you because you didn't just get a PhD. You won the Ballhouse Prize for the best PhD thesis of the year. I mean, you were a prodigy. <laughs> that, you know, sometimes you have to be lucky in life. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. You can be modest too. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I was lucky. Look, I have an amazing advisor and I was in an amazing school. And so, look, this this was a long time back in 98. I finished in my PhD. So, uh, and I was doing things that were extremely interesting, yeah, but uh, my my heart was not to continue in academia. I used to have a, a boss a while back, he was a mathematician, a PhD in mathematics, and he went to research in just uh, mathematics into Wall Street. And he always told me, hey, you will like this, you will like investing. Uh-huh. And you will like the whole environment and, and the cutting edge science, because a lot of the things that we study in science are very applicable in investment. And so I always have that bug in my mind. 
And so I had the opportunity to switch instead of continue being in academia and become a professor and whatnot. Uh, and I switch. And so I moved into finance and I got a job in at DFA uh, in the research group. How did you link up with DFA? <laughs> That's that's the most weird thing. So a lot of things are random in life. So I was at Caltech and DFA was looking for someone to work in research with Ken French and Jim Fama. And I apply. And, you know, you apply and you cross your fingers. And I was lucky enough that they hired me. And yeah, DFA was a small. I think that I was employee 107. And I think, I think that at the time DFA had around 25 billion. It was a great opportunity to work with some magnificent people in a small company where you were able to get involved in basically all the different aspects, not only research, but the legal aspects of what you were doing, the portfolio management, the trading aspect, the marketing aspect. So it was a magnificent opportunity. I was lucky. And interesting, though, that DFA would look at you, given your background. I mean, clearly the forward thinking of the David Booth and uh, Jean Fama, Ken French, who were both on the board of directors there, decided with you, with no financial background really, in it, it, that you were the guy who they were going to bring in, and they kind of overstepped all the PhDs in economics. Well, I, I don't know who else was applying, to be fair. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. I think you're giving me more credit than I deserve. Look, I was living in California. My wife is from California. And the job was in California, so it was a perfect match for me, and I was very, very lucky on that. And, and I was extremely lucky to work with the talented people, like you mentioned. No? If, it was like doing a second PhD when you start working with Ken and Gene, because you have to read, 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 and read, and, and do research. In, but that's what you are trained when you do a PhD from a top university, no matter what's the field. The training is training how to learn, how to get to the cutting edge, of the science and then try to push it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. That's a PhD program. Great. And so working with these professors was basically the same, getting to the cutting edge of the science and then try to help pushing it a little bit forward. And that's what I was doing. And by 2007, you became the co-chief investment officer with David Booth at DFA. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, that's probably when I first met you back then, about 15 years ago. And then uh, in 2009, you became the co-CEO. And at this time, wasn't DFA moving to Austin? Yes. DFA opened an office in Austin, I think, 2007. Yeah. And so I told my wife, let's move to Austin. She agreed. So we went there. Uh, we have three kids. So uh, I, I became, I was CIO and then became co-CEO with David. What was a, a great honor, no? Sure, absolutely. And you get on the board of directors and you get on the, you became a director of the mutual funds. But then in 2017, I've heard you use the word retire. I use the, you use the word resign. I mean, you decided to leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my wife is from LA, no? Um, her parents are here, LA. Um, so in 2015, before my oldest one started high school, the family wanted to move back to LA because the, the, grand, the grandparents are not getting younger, let's put it that way. Uh, and if we were staying in, in, in Austin, we would have to stay there at least for another 10 years because we have three, three sons and they, we didn't want to move kids when they are in, in high school. So the family decided to move in 2015 to Los Angeles. And so I was going back and forth to Texas on top of going everywhere. I was putting 250,000 miles a year between going to Texas and going, going <laughs> everywhere around the world. So you see, it was probably not the right balance. Right. And I was never home, never seen the family. And so mm. it was not the right balance. So I, I basically resigned without any job in mind. You can call it retire. It was not a permanent retirement, I guess. But Well, you, you started doing research one of your papers on value and profitability in international and emerging markets that you co-wrote during this period of time. But around the same time as it was being peer-reviewed and, and published, you then decided to take a job with uh, Avantis, uh, which was a new company. Now, did the company form because you were coming on board or did it f 
form, and then you came on board. So let, let me speak a little bit about how all that happened. I was not working, but like you, when you, you work a long term in the industry, you get to know a lot of people and people have magnificent ideas. And some people at American Center Investment you know, in Kansas City that I know them for a long, long time. They wanted to start something new, something that is more systematic, low cost, because there is a big need for something like that in the market. And they reached out if I wanted to help them. And they were willing to do it based in LA, where I live. So that's great. And one of the things that I have as a condition is that the, the investment strategies, let's call funds, ETF, what they were going to be, they have to be low fees. That's what they wanted. They wanted to start something systematic, organized from day one, is so that you have all the checks and controls on costs so you can be low fee and still have a, a, a very good business. Mm -hmm. So I agreed to work together with American Century and start Avantis. So Avantis was going to be a standalone company where the people in Avantis own a piece of that and American Century owns another piece of that. Yeah, But we decided not to do that. Why? Because that was going to impose more costs and that was going to make us have higher expense ratios. So what we did is we created Advantis as a unit inside American Center. So I'm an employee of American Century, but I have a business card that is called Advantis because we manage money different than the traditional American Century manager. And I report to the CEO of uh, American Century. So we're a unit that is a little bit outside of American Century, but we are part of American Century. But all our operations, legal, compliance, HR, think about all the support functions that you need to have a professional asset management company are done by American Century personnel. Yeah. And where is the trading done? Is it done through American Century or are you doing it on your own? Depends on what. And you know, when you do ETFs, you know, a lot of the trading is happens in kind, in and out. Yeah. So if that's the part, we do it on our own. Whenever we need to trade stocks, we work with American Century Trading Desk that is segregated our trades in a different way of trading that we think uh, we don't have to demand liquidity to trade and we can be very efficient. And you have different products. I mean, most of your money, I believe, is in ETFs, but you also have traditional mutual funds and you have private individual accounts. But can you break that down? You've got about $10 billion under management right now, which is a great number just getting started over a couple of years. How much of that is ETFs? How much of it is mutual funds? And how much are private accounts? The, the vast majority of the money, but the vast majority of the money is ETF. And, and why that? Because for most investors, an ETF is a better vehicle. And you know that. Well, I know that, but why do you know that? <laughs> That's an inside joke, by the way, between Eduardo and me. So it goes back a long, long way. Because I spent years trying to convince dimensional fund advisors they should have ETFs. <laughs> both, of, both, of know, both of us know that ETF is by far a better vehicle, not only because of tax advantages, but also because you save on costs of different kinds. For example, in certain cases, you don't have to pay some taxation when you buy securities, like stamp duties when you buy securities in other countries. So ETF is it's, it's a much better vehicle. But for some investors, let's think about 401k plans. Yeah, the, the ETF really doesn't work because the operations of the 401k plan is different. So it works for the brokerage window, but not for the default options. Correct. Our goal is to try to help everyone with the right vehicle. We have no biases. But I have looked at the performance of an ETF and a mutual fund, same strategy, the same might be small cap value, large cap value, whatever it is, yeah. where you have an ETF and you have a mutual fund. And there are slight differences in return between them, but the fee is the same. So maybe you can explain why that is. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. If you were running an index fund, and you have pre-described holdings, so you have securities and weights in both of them, the performance probably will be the same with small differences. But if you're running a strategy that is trying to use today's information, eh, the performance will be slightly different between both. Why? Because a lot of the trading that happened in a mutual fund happened depending on where when the cash flows come. You know, I see. If you give me money today, 
I'm going to invest in the securities that are great to have in the portfolio today. But if I don't have money today, I have money tomorrow, I may have to wait for tomorrow to do. So you have the, the regular trading and rebalancing, but you have an effect of cash flows that forces more one direction than another. It's more in a mutual fund, you always have to carry cash. Mm -hmm. Why? Because if you have a redemption in a mutual fund, I have to have cash to send it to you tomorrow. Yeah. And I cannot sell securities tomorrow to raise money to, to wire on the same day because settlement of those securities is two days later. So you have to carry cash in the mutual fund. And not much, but you have to have some cash. If that cash that you carry is not enough, you have to hit the line of credit in order to be able to wire the money. So even though the strategies are the same, there is a small difference in, in how you have to manage them in order to deal with the different settlement of clients' transactions. Yeah, And if you think about that, the ETF is way more efficient because the ETF when you purchase an ETF, I receive securities in kind. So I'm always invested. And when you redeem, you receive securities in kind. So the long-term shareholder don't have to bear the cost of the redemption. So the, the, that there is always going to be a difference in performance between the ETF and the fund, but those differences should be a small. Now, when can those differences become very big or, or bigger, let's call it, when the market moves a lot? If you have a day that the market moves 10 percent, yeah, and you have a purchase uh, that it represents a one percent of the fund or a two percent of the fund in cash flow, well, that money is not invested until tomorrow morning, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if the ma market moves 10 percent, right there you can see that you have uh, 20 basis points in difference in performance because you are carrying cash overnight. And it's not your cash. I mean, generally, if the investors are in it for the long term. It's not their cash that's causing this. It's some other investor's cash that's causing this. Yes. No, it's not the long-term investors. An ETF, the long-term investor is kind of protected from the actions of people coming in and out. Mm -hmm. In a mutual fund, no. You are, you are commingling and cash is coming in, cash is going out. So you, you are exposed to the actions of other shareholders. And that causes difference in performance. Now, Vanguard has a unique structure, and I know they have a patent on this, but their ETF and their open-end mutual fund are just share classes of the same pot of money. And that patent someday, I thought it was last year, but maybe this year, is actually going to come off patent. In which case, is it beneficial or would it be beneficial for other fund companies to adopt that patent where there's a, one pool of money and then there's a ETF share class, and there's a mutual fund share class. What's the advantage and disadvantage of doing it the Vanguard way? That's a great question. We thought about that to, to say, do we want to have a, a big pot of money, big fund, where one share class is an ETF and the other share class is a mutual fund? And we decided not to do it. Let's go through the logic. Let's suppose that you have a mutual fund share class, a mutual fund, yeah, and, and with a mutual fund share class. And I decide to attach to that mutual fund an ETF share class. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you are the mutual fund shareholder, you are going to be very, very happy about that because you have people coming in kind in and out dealing with your capital gains and not imposing any costs on you because they're coming in kind. It's not that they give you cash and the portfolio manager had to trade and the cost is spread out about uh, across all the shareholders. No, if you have a mutual fund and you attach an ETF share class, the mutual fund shareholders will be ecstatic, will be very happy about that. Yeah, right. I agree. Let's go to the other case. I have an ETF share class and I put a mutual fund share class on the side. Will the ETF shareholders be happy? No, they will not be happy. Why? Because people coming in the mutual fund are coming in cash. And who pays for those transactions? Everyone. Mm -hmm. Even the ETF shareholders. So the ETF shareholders pay their way in, pay, pay their way out. But they also have to pay a fraction of all the people coming in and out on the mutual fund. So it's, it's not really fair to them. And so on top of that, if you have the shareholders in the mutual fund redeeming a lot of money, the ETF shareholder may take a tax bill that they are not expecting because there are cash transactions in, in the mutual fund share class. So 
what we decided is to have different pools of money, one for ETF and one for mutual fund. If you want a mutual fund, you know what you're facing. You're, you're having a commingled vehicle and you're exposed uh, to the actions of other shareholders, externalities due to other shareholders. But you trade at NAV and, you know, it, it's, it's it, for some people, that's easier. In a 401k, as you said, you, you have to do in it a, that way. In a 401k, you have to do it. In, in, if you go to ETF, you're going to pay your win in and way out when you buy in the market based on spreads and whatnot, but you are going to be protected from the actions of sh other shareholders because of the in-kind purchase and redemption mechanism. So by separating them, we give people a pure benefit of one or the other and they can decide what's better for them. They are not going to be blindly surprised by the action of the other pool of money that is coming in and out in a different way that they are. Okay, let's go into a different topic and that has to do with how you invest money. You invest money using factors and you're a, a quantitative factor investor. But before we get too deep into all these different factors, what is a factor? So the factor basically is, is a way to understand the performance of securities. For example, let's suppose that a small cap securities have a better expected performance than large cap securities. So a factor is the difference in performance between the small cap securities and large cap securities. Okay, well, let me stop for a second. Why would small cap have a re expected higher return than large cap? Well, that, that's a great question because I'm going, let's just pick an, another factor and then we go back to a small cap. Okay. Because a small, <laughs> a small cap is probably the one that you cannot justify. A company, because just being a small, should not have a premium because you can have a small cap company with extremely high price and that's not going to have a premium. So let's just speak about the value factor. That's, that's easy. And about what is the value factor? If you can buy a security that has low price relative to a fundamental, let's say the book value of a company, well, that company tends to have a premium relative to a company that has a high price relative to the fundamental. Yeah. It's like you're buying something on a discount at a lower price, yeah? Okay, but why? Why Why would a company with a low price to earnings, low price to book, low price to cash flow, low price to something or just low price, why would we expect that to have a higher rate of return? That's a great question. So we have to start with the premise. It says, we believe that the market is priced in all the securities and we cannot find a better price than what the market has. There's an assumptions of different kinds. But we also believe that there is no need for the market to put the same return for every security. Different securities will have different returns. Different returns will have different discount rates. Yeah. The discount rate is a factor of the perceived riskiness of a security, correct? It can be risk or it can be something else. It can be behavioral, you know? Some people just, for whatever reason, dislike a lot a certain set of companies. And if there is enough people that dislike a lot those set of companies, those companies will trade at a little bit lower price. And so that's a higher discount rate. Let me push back just a hair on this, because I want to make sure I understand it, because there's this thing between risk and behavior that always goes back and forth with these factors. But to me, if it's true that there are a lot of people who just don't like these companies. They don't like them for a reason. And isn't it true that they don't like them because they see more risk there and lower returns and that's why they don't like them? So isn't it a fundamental factor? <laughs> it may or may not be. But the fact that a certain clientele moves away from certain sort of securities certainly will push the price of those securities lower. And that suddenly you have a higher discount rate because if the price is lower relative to the fundamental, you have a higher discount rate. But mm -hmm. let's go a little bit deeper in why there is a premium because you're asking is why certain securities have a premium, a higher return than others. Right. Okay. Uh, and so let's think about that. Let's suppose that I give you two options to work. So you work with us for one week and if you work us for one week, I give you $100. That's option one. Option two is if you work with us for one week, I give you zero dollars 
or $200. 50-50, depending on the weather of the last day. So 50-50 probability gives you zero or 200. The expected, the expected payment for you is the same. It's $100. So in one, you get $100 for sure. In the other one, you get an expected $100. But you can get zero or 200. Okay. Will you take that deal? In general, you will not take the second deal. You will take the $100 for sure. Because the other one... You can finish with zero to hundred. So now I'm going to try to spice it for you. I'm going to give you zero or 250. Mm -hmm. So now the expected, the expected payment to you is not a hundred and a hundred. It's a hundred and a hundred and twenty-five. 50% zero, 50% to 50. So I'm incentivizing you with a premium to take the more risky outcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. At some point, if I keep on increasing the incentive, at some point, you are going to say, I take the risky outcome. So whenever you have a risky investment, it's not that the expected outcome is the same as a less risky investment. The more risky investment will have a return that is a little beyond the the, just the same expectation. You will have a premium because it's, it's, that premium is what incentivizes you to take a little bit risk, a little bit of that risk. Because if you do a perfect risk adjustment and you have the same, same expected outcomes, you will never take the risky investment. So okay. there has to be a premium, a little bit more return. So when you are speaking about security, how low price related to fundamentals, and we're saying that's a value investing strategy, why there is a premium? Because not every security has the same expected returns. There is no need, there is no logic for that. So when you're looking for security that are low related to fundamental, what you're trying to do is identify those securities that are having higher discount rate, higher expected returns. And then put a diversified portfolio together of just those securities. Yes, but you can see that when I, what you were mentioning, hey, you are saying low price related to fundamental. But what we're trying to do is try ways, systematic ways, mechanical ways, if you want to think about that, to identify what securities have high discount rates, because the discount rate is your expected return. Mm -hmm. So what security has these high expected returns? Now, every model is incomplete. The models don't describe reality. But what financial science has been doing over time is trying to make better and better models, trying to understand what variables matter most. And that's why you have so many factors, because people start looking at different variables and they say, well, this variable explains something about returns and this other variable explains about other returns. And I think you have like 400 factors now. Yeah. I think there's a paper called the factor zoo. The vector zoo. Yes. So the, the issue that we're facing now is there's so many factors, how we put all this together. And there are many, many different people put this together in different ways. Some people do optimization. So let's put all these factors optimize and we see what happens at the end. Mm -hmm. But you know, as well as me, whenever you put a big soup of estimated numbers, in an optimization, uh, you get very weird outcomes. Uh, <laughs> so the factor zoo. So we've got, uh, I talked about large versus small. And that factor was strong decades ago. But it seems to me since the proliferation of small cap index investing, in other words, became much, much easier to invest in a big, massive mega portfolio of small cap stocks. It wasn't so easy 50 years ago. It's easy now to do that. And, I, and that led to the term, well, led to factor decay. In other words, it went away. It, it was easy to identify these small cap companies. It was easy now to package them together into these index funds, mutual funds, extended market, small cap funds, whatever. And because of that, I, I believe, and I might be wrong about this, but I believe that caused this factor to decay to the point where there really isn't a big premium anymore, as you mentioned earlier. You, what you are observing is absolutely right. Now, the, the, the question is not if it has decayed. The question is, was it there on day one? Oh, okay. 
And why is that? Let's suppose that we go to the zoo one day and we see that animals with the stripes are zebras. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that every animal with the stripe will be a zebra because a tiger will have stripes. Yeah. So the fact that people observe that the small cups up to 81, I think it was, have a premium, that can have been a random outcome. Yeah. Mm. And the fact that we don't see much of that after that period, it may be because that's reality. And why I was pushing back in the small cap premium? Because when I was speaking about value, I was telling you, you have a low price related to fundamentals. You are looking for companies that have high discount rates. And if they have any high discount rate will push the price down. So there is a logic there. And just to clarify, a discount rate means you need to get a higher rate of return. It's a cost of capital. Exactly. The company has to get a higher rate of return for you to invest in that company because you perceive, true or not, you perceive that there's more risk there. So you need to get a higher rate of return. Yeah. If a company is going to produce a dollar in the future, you're not going to pay that dollar in the future with the dollar today. You're going to pay... 70 cents today to get a dollar in the future, 50 cents today to get a dollar in the future. So the lower the number that I'm paying today for a dollar in the future is the higher discount rate, higher discount rate. So when you have a strategy that is trying to buy low price securities related to fundamentals, what you are really tra trying to capture is that high discount rate, that, that higher mm -hmm. expected return due to the low price today. But if I tell you, you are buying a small caps, there is nothing that tells you that a small cap security can have a premium. If not, you can divide a large company in a, piece, a bunch of pieces and suddenly you have a premium. And more, more logically, let's suppose that you have a small cap company. Yeah. If I have that small cap company and, they, and that company has a very, very high price relative to fundamentals, that company should not have a premium because the price is too, too high mm -hmm. relative to fundamentals. So the small cap premium is highly debatable. Let's put it that way. Well, let's go ahead and then move on to some other factors because we, we talked about small cap potentially not being there anymore or maybe it wasn't there to begin with. We talked about the value factor, price to book, price to some fundamental. You also, in, in your company, are looking at profitability as yeah. a factor. So tell us about profitability. Yeah, that's a great question. So Imagine that you are going to buy a company. How much you're going to pay for that company? You know, I'm, I'm buying Rick's company. What, how much I have to pay? Well, I have to pay for the equity that you have in your company. Yeah. But I also have to pay for your cash flows. But since your cash flows are in the future and they're uncertain, I'm going to discount those future and I'm going to pay less today for those future cash flows than the, the, the value of those future cash flows. So the price that I'm paying for your company is your equity plus a discounted value of your future cash flows. Yeah. So remember, what I'm interested in is in that discount rate. Yeah. And what variables I know? I know the price because Bloomberg telling me the price every minute. I can have a proxy for the equity in the company and I have, have a proxy for the cash flows of the company. And these three variables, because of the valuation framework that I mentioned with you, are related to the discount rate, to the expected returns. A company that has higher expected returns will have a lower price for the same equity value and for the same cash flow expectations than a company that has a lower expected returns. So the higher the expected returns, the lower the price, keeping the other two variables constant, keeping the equity, and the cash flows. So I need to take into account not only the equity that I can use book value as a proxy for equity, I also need to take into account the cash flows of the company. I have to take both the both set of financials, the balance sheet and the income statement, both set of financials to identify what companies have high discount rate, high expected returns. When you're selecting the securities then for your funds, is it a fixed formula where you're using some percentage of book value, some percentage of profitability together in your model? Or is it a variable thing where it moves? <laughs> no, it's fixed. It's fixed. It's so look, there is enough uncertainty in life that if you have it fixed, 
is already there is uncertainty to add a variable component. There is no way for us to, to have so much precision. So we want to use the main drivers of selecting securities that are how much money the company is making, what's the equity position of the company, what's the price relative to these two variables. And once we have that, we have enough information to put together a well-diversified portfolio that, in our opinion, has high spectral returns. Trying to be more clever than that and just changing the weight of the security with market conditions or the factors or the components with market conditions and everything else mm -hmm. is just adding noise with no really known outcome. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say one thing, but then I'm going to move right on to something else. So what I was getting at was you don't do what's called factor rotation, where you're trying to go from one factor to another, to another, to another. No, no. Companies are very hot on doing factor rotation. And, and they're saying that, well, if we move at this time from this factor to that factor to over to this factor, that somehow, some way they're going to get an excess return from rotating their portfolio around and highlighting different factors at different times. And you don't find any value in that at all. No, that's I'm predicting where the market is going to be is the same. It, you know, if you can predict the performance of a given factor, it's the same saying you can predict the performance of the market. Imagine who we could do that. That would be great, but the markets that's not how it works. The performance of market is unpredictable because oh, there are news that we don't even know that they're coming and they will come. I don't know what it will be, but it will come something and something new tomorrow. So you have your list then, you come up with your portfolio of what you would like to buy. But there's another factor that we haven't talked about yet. It's called momentum. And this is looking at the price and, and seeing if it's moving uh, down or moving up. And we don't want to try to catch a falling knife is a phrase that we hear often with uh, quant quantitative analysis. So could you talk about how you use momentum in your portfolio management? Yeah, so momentum is, is fascinating. It's, 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 it's a little bit like a small caps. When I was telling you small caps, there is no logic for the system in small caps. Uh, there is a logic while the premiums are small, large in small caps. Small, the value premium in small cap is larger than the value premium in large cap. There is a logic for that. But the existence of a small cap premium, there is no logic. For momentum, it's the same. Momentum is something that we observe but we don't understand why it happens. And there are two competing visions of why that happens. So what is momentum? A, a security that has extremely bad performance will continue to have, for some short period of time, bad performance. And a security that has extremely good performance will continue to have, for some short period of time, good performance. So how do we use momentum? If we have a value strategy where buying security have low price, yeah? Mm -hmm. How the security becomes low price? One probability is because the price is going down. The security has very bad performance. Well, we can go and buy the security immediately, or you can say, wait, don't buy it now. Wait a little bit until the price stabilizes. And so that's what we do. We decide not to buy immediately, not to jump into this security that have extremely bad performance, and we decide to wait a little bit until the price stabilizes. And so we try to prevent buying securities in downward momentum. Yeah? Mm -hmm. The opposite for upward momentum. If you have a security that is a small value, for mm -hmm. example, and it's in upward momentum, we are willing to slightly overweight that security. And if the security starts going up in in price and instead of being a small cap now becomes a, a mid cap security instead of sell it immediately we may be willing to hold it a little bit longer why because the momentum premium is very very strong but it's very short-lived so if it's, i can get a little bit of push because of our momentum and uh, just by holding the security a little bit longer so we incorporate momentum downward and upward momentum in our strategies uh, but we are very, very careful how we do it, because if you, if you are not, you finish with a very, very high turnover. Let me ask a question about factor premiums. Now, you have a multi-factor model where you're using profitability and value combined to come up with what you were expect to be a premium over beta, expect to be a premium over the market return. Do you have a, a way of determining what that premium 
should be going forward? What are we looking for on a long only portfolio, not a long and short, but just a long only portfolio? Yeah, no, long, long only. I, I, I don't think any one of us needs a short portfolio. So <laughs> we, we're more happy to have a long only, you know. This is a great question. So it, the, the question is, can we know at any point in time how much the market is discounting future yes. cash flows? And the answer is no. And uh, why not? I mean, that's where behavioral finance gets together with rational markets. In different periods of time, for the same level of risk, people may be willing to take a lower price or a higher price. You know, we change. You know, the market change. You know, in periods of high anxiety, people are priced humongous mm -hmm. discount rates. The price are very, very depressed. In other periods, the price is higher, and so the market is having lower expected returns. And you cannot really know at any point in time how big or how small is that premium? What you know is that it's a premium, but there is research that is very interesting that shows, look, look at the long-term average of these premiums. That's probably as good as it gets. Mm -hmm. Now, some people say that if you look at the market, historical market performance relative to treasury bills, for example, probably was higher than what we should expect in the future. I would agree. Some people say that because now the market, you now more people embrace investing in the market. There is more more of us that are buying securities than what they were in the past. And so if you have a higher clientele, basically more people willing to take a little bit of that risk. We're increasing the price and we're reducing the specter returns. There is a logic. I think another piece of logic is are treasury bills correctly priced? If you're going to use that as the risk-free rate. <laughs> Based on where treasury bills are currently priced, I think that the premium could be high. But if treasury drills were correctly priced based on where the inflation rate is, I think that the premium might be a lot lower. So I don't know if treasury bills are the right risk-free rate to use, even though that's what's being used in the models. Yeah, you are right about what is the risk-free rate is interesting. And, and But, the, you know, you, we're not just speaking about short-term periods. We're speaking about long-term periods. Sure. And so if, if we think about that, uh, expected returns of the market may be a little bit smaller than what we have seen in the past. Uh, mm -hmm. There is more willingness of people to embrace the market and embrace market risk, and there is more people to do that, then you would expect premiums to be a little bit smaller. Is that the same for value investing? Uh, and when I say value, I, I think the generalized ways of value, like what we do. I think that there is no information about more people embracing this uh, than before. They may be smaller than historical premiums. They may be not. Now, the traditional way of defining value, like if you are looking low price to book without looking at the, at, at, at the cash flows of the company, that probably is not the right way to do it. And so mm -hmm. science has evolved from there. So better, I think it's better if people evolve from that. Let me ask a question about U.S. versus international, because you did this paper on uh, using value and profitability in international markets. I is it different outside the U.S.? Is it different in emerging markets than in the U.S. market? And how do you have to change your formula? OK, so if, if you remember, uh, I told you a story about the valuation of the company. So what is the value of the company? The price of the company is the equity plus the cash flows is counted by some discount rate. But I never told you that that valuation is only valid in the United States. I think that, that valuation was valid when the Babylonians were selling and buying donkeys. And probably <laughs> it's going to be the same in the future when we are selling and buying water or oxygen if we ever live in Mars. So <laughs> this, this is an evaluation framework, the beauty of evaluation framework that is valid in all the different environments. It's different from a pattern. A pattern may be valid here and not somewhere else. So the way that we do things is based on evaluation framework to understand what what factors or what matters in the spectral returns of a company. And basically, it works all around the world. It works in the U.S. It works in international. It works in emerging markets. So the research is very robust from that point of view because you have a research that you can apply with evaluation framework everywhere. Now, when you are speaking about the variables itself, you have to adapt to realities. For example, in the United States, companies report financials quarterly. But in some countries, 
report only uh, twice a year. And so you have to adapt with the data and try to make the best that you have with the data of the different countries in order to have the model use the right set of information. Let me ask a question about small cap value funds. I personally have a small cap value uh, tilt in my portfolio. I don't yet have an international small cap value tilt. And one of the questions I have is, why are there no global small cap value index funds or ETFs? You know, I've been asked that many times. It's more, we, we may be thinking about doing one outside the United States, not for U.S. investors, for outside the United States. And, and, and why we don't have one in the United States? We have, as you know, we have a U.S. small value strategy, an international small value strategy, and an emerging markets meet and a small value strategy. And we do meet and a small together in emerging just because to have more liquidity and the number of securities. But we don't have one that puts the three of them together. Correct. Why Why is that? Because uh, different investors want to have different allocation to the U.S. versus emerging versus international. And if we put all together, then constrain the investors to decide which one to buy. Now, uh, how to weigh them. Now, <laughs> yeah, I understand. But think, think about this. <laughs> when you buy an ETF, yeah? What is your fixed cost? Do you pay ticket charges? No, you don't pay ticket charges. So buying three ETFs is the same as buying one because you don't have ticket charges. So given that you don't have ticket charges, just buy three securities instead of buying one. And that gives you the freedom to decide how you want to weight them. Okay, I I, I will push back here because okay, you, you have a global real estate portfolio, a real yes. estate, but you, you, but you just finished saying you should have a U.S. small value and an international small value, but yet you have a global real estate fund. So explain why. Yeah, that's a great question. So you say you can have a U.S. A real estate and international real estate. And I will tell, yes, you're right. We can have a U.S. and an international. Now, an international real estate market is much, much smaller than the U.S. real estate market. 30% versus 70 so international versus U.S. Yes. So an ETF for international real estate that will have a very, very small allocation in someone's portfolio, we said, no, let's put it all together in real estate and let's give that to someone because I maybe I'm wrong, but we say no one worries too much about how much U.S. or non-U.S. So someone wants a full U.S. ETF real estate or they are happy to have a global uh, real estate so we say let's pro provide global the global real estate market has been developing it, you know uk reads i think at are 15 years old j reads so it's developing at some point we may split it or you know, have two versions or one not but for now we decided global probably is the right decision i i can give you the pros and cons of a global small cap value fund uh the pros are, man, it's a lot more convenient than buying three funds. Just buy one small value, covers the world, I'm happy. What's the disadvantage? Well, the disadvantage is taxes and the foreign tax credit if you're going to put it in your taxable account. Because since less than 50% of the portfolio is going to be an international, you don't get the foreign tax credit. So in a taxable portfolio, you still have to divide it up between a U.S. small value and an international small value, so you get the tax credits on the international small value. But if this was going to go into a, an IRA account or a, a Roth account of some form, which I could see a global small cap value uh, into a, a Roth account, that it would make sense, at least from my standpoint as an advisor, where I get this factor exposure using one fund. It, there, is a, there is a need for it, I believe, out there. So I'm just plugging that. <laughs> <laughs> you are not the first one telling us that, to be fair. Okay. But, but I also go through that and say, look, uh, if you have three ETF, you don't have ticket charges in custodians. But you have three funds. I, mean, I don't want three funds. I want something <laughs> simple. <laughs> anyway, let's go to the next thing. You know, we, we've involved. We have the factor zoo now, okay? We also have things like uh, artificial intelligence, and we have machine learning. And behavioral finance can be thrown into that as well. Are you 
looking at these things to incorporate them into your world and how you do things? You know, it, the whole thing of machine learning and neural networks and all this is fascinating because what it's trying to do is trying to emulate how the brain works in learning or a collection of entities works in learning in order to uh, to learn without having a pre, pre, predefined model. Yeah. So, but isn't that what the market does? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the, the market the market is a big machine learning uh, machine that does machine learning. The market is a, is a network of this you know a, a loose network of people interacting in order to increase some benefit for everyone collectively everyone but individually each one of the individuals each one is just trying to incorporate the information that they come in order to come with prices. So the whole market is a big machine learning network. Now, if I were an active manager picking stocks, and I think that I can do better than the market and find what securities are underpriced and securities underpriced, probably will invest a lot of money there and say, oh, I'm going to be better than everyone else and find all the undervalued securities and all the overvalued securities. That's not us. So I'm not going to dispute the market price and create my model. And then I will say my model is better than the market because the market is as good as it gets. You know, whatever our model is, is going to be sub part of the, to the market, in my opinion. So the market gives us a price of the securities. What we do is try to use that price in order to identify what securities have been priced at higher discount rates. So, so they have higher expect returns and what securities have been priced at a lower spectrum returns. There may be things that are interesting in machine learning to apply even to what we do. And for example, you we were speaking about uh, finding factors, no, or finding drivers of spectral returns. You could have imagined that all these factor research could have been done with machine learning. So we can have a machine learning trying to find what variables that are related to valuations have different levels of impact in the spectral returns of the security and that could have been done but that's what the professors you know and researchers all around the world have been done in, in a loose way so yeah you can use it but a lot has been done even if we don't call it machine learning let me ask a question that was posed to me it has to do with esg okay so esg is big has popular in Europe for sure, and maybe becoming a little more popular here in the United States than in the past. But it's very hard to find a small cap value ESG fund for the people who want factors and want ESG. Any interest there? Uh, we we are getting into the, the responsible investment business. So we're going to launch a couple of strategies, uh, three strategies uh, that have high exposure to a small volume in in the near future let's put it that way let's get into the last topic and that has to do with fixed income you do have a few fixed income funds and you do run a strategy based on the yield curve trying to enhance the return based on yield curve in other words you say the yield curve is telling you something could explain your fixed income investment strategy and why it there may be an expectation for a higher return than just doing a a regular straight index fund. There, there is a couple of things that are very, very interesting when you think about fixed income. Let's just speak first about indexing. You know that how the index works. The index that an index manager follows in fixed income incorporates every bond as there have been issued. So if you issue a bond, that bond is incorporated in the index automatically. Now, if you recap to issue a bond, are you going to issue in a way that increases your cost or reduces your cost of servicing that debt? You're going to try to minimize your cost. Mm -hmm. So you're going to issue in the conditions, say duration or whatever else, that minimize your cost. Yeah. Yes. But if you are minimizing your cost, you're also minimizing my expected returns if I'm the investor in that bond. Mm -hmm. So the automatic inclusion of bonds it's, it's really a detriment for an index in fixed income. Now, you mentioned 
we use something else. We, we need to have, like in equities, we need to have an idea what bonds will have higher expected returns than others, given the same credit quality and everything the same. And we do that by using the yield curve. So what do we mean by that? Let's suppose that you have a bond and you hold it to maturity. And let's suppose that the bonds of default. Yeah. What is your expected return on that bond? Your expected return of that bond is your yield to maturity. Assuming you can reinvest the income at the yield to maturity rate. Let's let's assume that it's zero coupon. Life is easy. <laughs> Life is easy. Zero coupon. <laughs> zero coupon. So your zero coupon bond that has a yield to maturity of 2%, your average return, if you hold that bond to maturity, is 2% a year. Correct. But your return from year to year is not going to be 2%. That's correct. Because if you have a three-year bond under the typical yield curve, the yield curve is has lower yields to maturity for shorter durations and higher yields to maturity for longer duration. So if I have a three-year bond that gives me yield to maturity 2%, one year from now, that bond will be shorter to maturity. So on expectation, we have a lower yield to maturity than today. So you can see the yield to maturity was the average return to maturity, but that means that doesn't mean that every year is the same. In general, the longer portion of that holding period will have higher returns than the shorter portion of that holding period. So you can use information in the shape of the yield curve to decide when that bond has higher than average returns relative to the yield to maturity and when it's going to have lower expected returns relative to yield to maturity. And we use that information to create portfolios. In geekish fixed income, what you're talking about is a horizon return. Yes. If you're going to use it for two years, you're going to keep it for two years and then you're going to sell it. You're going to do what we call riding the yield curve. Yes. This 2% bond that you purchase, because the last year, the yield to maturity on that bond might only be a half a percent, and you bought it at 2% as a three-year, after the first two years, if you sold it, uh, you're going to get a return on that that's much higher than the 2% yield. So the horizon yield might be 25 or 2.7 or whatever it is. Exactly. That's exactly what, what we're saying. See, I remember from my CFA days all of that stuff. <laughs> That's exactly what we're doing. Instead of trying to get an average income to maturity, we are happy to get an income from some period of time and a capital appreciation due to the change in the shape of the yield curve. And the convexity, as another geekish word, has a lot to do with this too. I mean, there are some bonds that this happens rapidly and there are some bonds where it takes more yep, time. Absolutely. And, and that's why the way we do it is we have an estimated yield curve for different issues. For every issue, we have an estimated yield curve depending on the sector, the credit quality and whatnot. Based on market information, we don't make predictions, remember. And then we use that estimated yield curve for every issue to compute the expected return of the bond for a horizon, like you mentioned. And then we use that information to create a portfolio. Very interesting. Well, Eduardo, it's been fantastic having you on Bogle Heads on Investing. I thank you very much for your time today and wish you a lot of luck. And I know you just passed 10 billion and hopefully you get to 100 billion quickly. <laughs> thank you very much. This concludes Bogle Heads on Investing, episode number 43. Join us each month as we have a new guest and talk about a new topic. In the meantime, visit bogleheads.org and the Boglehead Wiki. Check out the Bogleheads' new YouTube channel, Bogleheads' Twitter, Bogleheads' Facebook, and find out about your local Bogleheads chapter. And tell others about it. Thanks for listening.